all for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. I'd like for us to look today at one very short scripture in the fourth chapter of James, and it's the last verse in the chapter, verse 17. Much has been said in earlier, even in that chapter, <clears throat> and this is kind of a wrap-up verse. Generally, when anything, when a verse starts with the word therefore, it is then a, a final summation of all that has been previously said. And after a number of exhortations in the fourth chapter to cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, He will lift you up. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to weeping. For sin, turn to God. He will never fail to lift us up. After all of those exhortations, he then concludes with this in this chapter. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, James is giving us here some help in self-diagnosis spiritually. Now we are, I assume, aware almost constantly of our physical and maybe emotional status. We're either feeling fine or we're not feeling fine. And we, we understand the degrees of how bad we feel. You go to the doctor and you've got some pain you can't explain. And they'll ask you. They, they will solicit your cooperation in the diagnosis. Is the pain on a scale of 1 to 10? What is it? that assumes you have some degree of accuracy about your own situation. That is true of us, of course, then physical health, to a large degree emotional health and status. But a lot of times I think maybe even Christians or people who are knowledgeable about the things of God forget 
that we are active participants in our own spiritual diagnosis. Now, I won't get off in the brush too much, but, you know, back when they just began discovering fire, the wheel, and cooking meat, when I started the ministry, I would ask people, very frequently, I'd just say, where are you at spiritually? Where do you feel you're at? I don't do that anymore. Very infrequently. Because there's such a level of spiritual illiteracy that I never get a decent answer. So I figure out other ways to try to figure out helping them know where we're at. James assumes here that we should be participating in diagnosing ourselves. Ultimately, of course, the Holy Spirit is the diagnostician chief. But we help. We're supposed to. And we are, God wants us to know always where we stand. Am I right with God? Is the sky clear over my head? Do I have the witness of the Spirit in my heart? Is there a shadow over my soul for something that God is poking me in the chest about? Do I have that free, open approach to the Lord in prayer and in thought that comes with a clear conscience or not? We're supposed to know, and we're supposed to be able to diagnose ourselves. Hebrews has an interesting little phrase, that our senses are exercised through use, that's growing in grace and learning as we walk with God, to discern good from evil. It means then, A, that we are to discern good from evil about ourselves, and that that ability to participate in diagnosing ourselves grows sharper, clearer, more refined as we walk with God. So ultimately, we can tell among other things, who's talking to me? Is this God's voice? Is this Satan's voice? Is it my own craziness? <laughs> um, is it my own confusion? There are then some earmarks here on self-diagnosis that help us specifically in the all-important issue of what, what is sin and what is not. When am I legitimately guilty before God or when am I being accused by the accuser of the brethren who never stops lying to us about our condition? Now, he will tell generally, and I, this is a general rule, I don't know how specific we need to be with it all the time, but generally he's going to tell someone that's walking with God that has a tender conscience, you've displeased God, he's mad at you, you're walking over hell on rotten boards. And he will tell people who are not walking with God, you're fine. So we've got different voices talking to us. And he gives us some guidelines here how to tell our case, our condition. Now, there's some assumptions here. Really what we're talking about here 
is not only self-diagnosis, but a sense of accountability. So I want us to look here at some things that are assumed in this short little command. Statement of fact. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. First, let me define accountability really, is just God is justified in holding me responsible. Now, in other areas of life, we apply the same thing. Decent parents, if as much as we can, have to rely on several things that I want to also mention as assumptions with our children. You can't expect 17-year-old behavior out of a 4-year-old. Well, <laughs> sometimes it's equal. Um, but we, we judge them, discipline them, correct them, ground them, or, or whatever, based on the best calculation we can make of whether they knew or didn't know, whether they meant to or didn't mean to. Those things enter in, and God's a parent. And God is... He defines accountability as he is justified in holding me responsible, treating me as responsible being. Now, this assumes several things. One, sufficient knowledge of God's will for me. That includes, of course, Scripture. That includes my conscience. It includes that my conscience, that still small voice that checks me, warns me, corrects me. It's sometimes quiet. Let me put it this way. It's often that still, small voice. But it's not quite quiet enough. You understand what I mean? Oh, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, you did. Yes, you did. It's unquiet enough that I cannot plead ignorance. I heard his voice. My conscience spoke to me. His word speaks to me. I know. It assumes then sufficient knowledge of God's will for me in my life. What to do, what not to do, so forth. Second, it also assumes sufficient freedom on my part of action or volition. Volition is choice, will. I, God treats me like he made me. A free moral agent. A person with the capacity, the power to choose. He will do his best to influence that choice, but he does not ever compel it. He never makes me obey him. Sometimes he will make people carry out his will. We see that in Scripture where he quashed the plans of people. But it's not counted as obedience because it wasn't done voluntarily. Does that make any sense? Sufficient freedom, then, of choice that I, I know what is right and I have the freedom to choose. A third thing that's assumed, sufficient intelligence and maybe even psychological stability to make a choice and understand what I'm doing. 
a fourth thing that is assumed. And I don't want this to be confusing. But I'm not only responsible for the truth that I know that applies to me, God's will for me, but I'm also responsible for spiritual light that I don't have but could have had if I had not stilled God's voice, refused his pleadings, not read his word, if I would have availed myself, which I chose not to, I would have had more knowledge of God's will. I'm accountable for what I could have known had I obeyed God and thus been ushered into greater spiritual light. Those who turn away from God can't plead, I couldn't help it. No, you'd have light. You wouldn't be in the dark had you not back here refused the light. It also assumes, this command, assumes, let's say two things here. One, a creator who, I've touched on this in a sense, who decreed our moral freedom initially when he created us. So it assumes a creator who created us with such dignity. It includes a free will and knowledge and ability to, to not only comprehend but communicate with God. It assumes that initially at our creation. And a second huge thing is that when we as a race sinned against God and sold ourselves into bondage to Satan and the chains of sin, that that same God granted unto every human being what theologically is called prevenient or preventing grace. Or literally, it means the grace that goes before conversion. It is the, if you can think of it this way, where we were created free moral agents. We used that freedom to disobey God and suddenly found ourselves utterly bound in sin and bondage and slavery. But God, from the foundation of the world through His Son, immediately granted to us, to the whole human race, an, a sufficient amount of grace, which is enablement. He gave us enough that he freed us. There's a looseness in our handcuffs. There is a dim light in our sinful dungeon. There's enough to make out the outlines of the door and the way out. And he frees up our bound will enough, not to its original freedom, but enough that I can respond back to him when he stretches his hand out to me and says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He enables me to respond to that command. He gives me enough power to get to my feet and start to walk towards him. No command, there is no command, ever, anywhere, that God gives us as human beings that he doesn't grant of pure, free grace and mercy the ability to respond to him to fulfill that command. Now, I don't want to get in the weeds here, but we got there are weeds. 
That's why God can still hold us accountable if we don't respond to Him. No one can say, well, I'm bound by sin and I just can't do it. He knows we're bound by sin, but we're really not totally bound by sin anymore because He gave us enough grace to reach our hand up to God as He reaches His hand down to me. He immediately gave Adam and Eve as soon as they had sinned. We see the blindness, the stupidity. They're hiding in the bushes thinking God won't know where they're at. So there's, there is heavy darkness that they brought into their souls. But there was enough immediate empowerment and enablement that when they heard God's voice, they knew whose it was. How did they even know to recognize it? God's grace. It's called prevenient grace. It means the grace that goes before. The grace that draws me to God and enables me to respond to Him. I, I don't know sometimes how to even express it enough or accurately. How utterly blameless, chargeless God is in not only informing us what His will is and urging us to walk in it, but giving me the enablement and the strength and the power to do it. God, you'll, none of us can ever lay a charge against God that He was unfair. God has given us everything we need, Peter said, for life and for godliness. So God not only created us as free moral agents, but He immediately supplied a, enough light in the darkness of slavery of, to sin that we can see there's hope. And He said, you come to Me. Similarly, Old Testament, Isaiah, God speaks this great command, he said, he said this, Look unto me, all you ends of the earth, and be ye saved. What's he saying there? He gave me the ability, restored it to me, in spite of the bondage of sin, to look to him. And he also clearly teaches us there, there's no place else to look. Don't look anywhere else. There is no salvation. Isaiah again, God said, I am the only Savior. He said, I don't know any other Savior. Before me there was no God formed, and they will not be, he said, after me. Except he's never going away. So there isn't an after our God is so blameless in His efforts to call us to Him that He's then completely justified to say, that's sin. You know, I've told you, I've enabled you, there's no place to hide. To Him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. Now, he doesn't have to go into all the details here, but we know that sin will separate me from God. If unrepented of, I will end up lost in hell forever. Fools, fools, Proverbs says, mock at sin. Treat it lightly. Joke about it. Treat it indifferently. But when God says, oh, listen, that's sin. He means to carry with it every, everything that goes with sin, which is finally the second death, being cut off from God forever. 
To him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. This word, sin, plus, to him, that little phrase, means that sin is um, strictly, in the true sense, it is strictly personal. There's again the total fairness of God. He never holds me accountable for the light that somebody else has. He doesn't judge me on the light that my wife, my spouse, my children, my friends, the preacher, whoever. He, he judges us so fairly. He says, what do you know? What have I told you? And in brutal self in introspection and mirror gazing... I know, I know, I know what you told me, Lord. I know what you've been telling me. I know. To him that knows, doesn't do it. It's sin, personally. It may not be to the person sitting next to you in the pew, but it is to you. It's kind of like, I'm reminded of Peter. Jesus told Peter a bit of his future. He said, when you get old, they will bind you and carry you where you don't want to go. And it says that he was indicating <clears throat> his death. And it was martyrdom. And so Peter, not, by the way, having been to Pentecost yet, where his heart got cleansed, he immediately turns to Jesus and says, well, what about John? <laughs> and Jesus said, what is that to you? It's none of your business. What my will is for you is not the same for John. Now, it doesn't mean, okay, John, <clears throat> John can sell dope to little kids, but Peter can't. I'm not talking about that. But there are those clear directions that God gives to each of us, and we're responsible for them. So what it really further here is assumed, what's the definition then, the proper definition of sin, is an act, any act, to be properly labeled sin, I'm not talking about mistakes, faults, ignorance, all those things. For an act or an attitude to be officially by God labeled that sin, it must have two elements. One, knowledge of God's will, a decision not to do it. Okay? Now that's not that hard. What does that require, though? Ruthless honesty. Every man, proverb says, will proclaim his own goodness until it says his neighbor comes and questions him, <laughs> cross-examines him. The tendency of, of a sinful heart is to immediately rush to our own defense. No, they made me do it. Ever heard that before? Read Genesis 3. What'd you do, God said. Well, she's, she made me do it. Plus, if you hadn't made her, I wouldn't be in this mess. Listen, that is one of the core foundational ingredients of a sinful heart, is a desperate tendency of the, the most ridiculous ends of defending myself. God wants to cure us of that. Takes the blood of Jesus to get it out. But that's a core issue. So, for us to help 
in diagnosing ourselves. We have to be, well, let's put it this way. We have to be as critical of ourselves as we tend to be of everybody else. Oh, we know other people's sins, don't we? Ah, uh, he says he didn't mean that sniping thing he said to me, but I don't believe it. He meant it, and I know I did. And when you do the same thing to someone else, oh, I, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I, I, I. We're responsible, finally, <clears throat> to seek then God's grace and help to do His will. I don't want to finish here this morning by saying that there is just kind of a mental decision and or mental uh, assent to truth and then a purely personal human decision. Um, I, I will trust God, I'll do this, I'll do... You and I can't. Because we're bound in sin. It's only when we call out to God, it's like that dear man called out to Jesus whose son was demon-possessed. And he said, can you help us? And Jesus, Jesus responded back. It's a little obscure, but he responded back, what do you mean, can I help you? <laughs> Absolutely I can. If you believe. So he immediately puts a condition on him. And on us all. And what did that man do? Okay, I choose to believe. No. He fell down on his knees. He said, Lord, I do believe. But help my unbelief. That's the prayer to pray. It's a prayer that acknowledges, Lord, I want to do your will. My heart's to do your will. But I can't unless you grant me the grace and the help to do it. What is this then? It's God's plan of salvation, which is always, everywhere, in every age, and with every person. It is divine human cooperation. You and I not only are enabled by God to cooperate with Him, but we're required to. That's what it means then that we can stymie God's will for us. The Israelites, it says in Psalm 78, they turned back in the wilderness and limited the Holy One of Israel with whom nothing was impossible. But God said, you wouldn't let me. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, sobbed out loud, he looked at Jerusalem and said, Oh, you kill the prophets. You, everybody I send to you he says, How often, <clears throat> there's a contrast to these words, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. We can stop God as far as his will for us dead in his tracks. We'll pay for it for all of eternity. But that's the power God has granted to us to say no even to him. But then he's justified in judging us because he sufficiently makes clear to us what his will is and gives me all the help I need to do it. Now, this is, in a sense, general for each of us. And everyone is in a particular situation in, their, in your own hearts, in your own lives. And it may be that God is saying things to you in your own case that you need to stop or start or do or whatever. You may, be, you may not be a Christian. You may have been at one time and fell away. You may have never sought God for thorough, through thorough repentance, 
seeking forgiveness and newness in your heart. Why haven't you? If that's your case, God been silent. I had no idea I was sinning. I had no idea there was a gap between me and God. Why? I never knew that. No, don't give, don't give God that. God's actually quite smart. <laughs> he knows our thoughts before we think them. He knows our words before we say them. Don't try that with God. Second, whatever it is that God is telling you, do it. Jesus said to the servants at the marriage in Cana, a great text to preach on, to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. I love a little statement A.W. Tozer made. We need to think about it. He said, God's commands are not to be believed. They're to be obeyed. You understand? Oh, I believe that. Are you doing it? Not too long ago, on a Sunday, Dan closed by asking how many of us here knew you were saved. Good number of hands went up. Then he asked, which is peppered through the entire Bible, everywhere, how many know that the old carnal nature that we were born with has been removed from my heart by faith? And as Peter said, our hearts were purified by faith in our own personal infilling of the Holy Spirit. There were just a tiny smattering of hands. I wasn't surprised, but I was deeply grieved. This is not something that this congregation has never heard. If we know to seek God for forgiveness of sins and new birth, or to seek for a clean heart, why aren't we doing it? To him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's sin. We're going to close with prayer. I'm not going to have people raise hands and do all that kind of stuff. Half the time I think that might be sort of saving to us. You know, I'll, I've requested prayer. Uh, no. It's time. It's time for all of us. Always time for all of us. Not to believe what God's telling us. To do it. To do it. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this morning in the quiet of the sanctuary, as always, we know you're at work. And I pray this morning, Lord, for us to look back on what we sang in one of the songs before we ever heard a word this morning out of your Bible. We all lifted up our voices and confessed, Lord, we need you. Every hour, we need you. So, Lord, to live out this life that we've learned about, that our pastor shared with us this morning out of your word, we need you. We need you to reveal to us what you see in our lives as sin that we need to clean up. We need to be able to be obedient by your grace. We can't do this without you, but we have to cooperate with you this morning, Lord. We have to, we have to come in agreement on wherever it is that we sit in our chairs this morning, Lord. We have to come into agreement with what you're laying on our hearts that, yes, Lord, I confess that I do agree with you with where I'm at. And then not get up as A.W. Tozer taught and as our pastor taught us this morning. 
not to get up to say that I believe that God spoke to me this morning, that I believe what he spoke to me is true, but that we obey it. We have to cooperate with you, Lord, and obey what you lay on our hearts. And we always have to remember that we don't do it by our own strength. We do it by surrendering to your grace, to your enabling grace that will help us to walk in a manner of what you want us to do. The book of Micah, I think, is where it's at, Lord, where you make it very clear what you want from a man and from a woman. And this morning you've done that. You made it very clear, very simple, and very clear on what this scripture holds for us. Now help us to believe, but to get up and obey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.